What's up? This is Rebel Radio. What up? What up? This is DJ Newmark. This is Peanut Butter Wolf. It's your boy. It's okay. Keep checking out Rebel Radio. Rebel Radio. This is Rebel Radio. We're in the place right here. Uh? Rebel Radio is going down. Would you say Rebel Radio? Oh, wait. Let's do it again. Rebel Radio. What's up, y'all? It's the Rebel Radio Show. I'm your host, Josh Levine. Welcome back. Hey, I would love to know what you thought of last week's show with Taz as my guest. That was our first Artwork Rebels series co-hosted with Gorilla One. And I'm curious what you thought of my co-hosting and, and all of that. So send us a note on Twitter, on Facebook, leave us a review on iTunes, or uh, just send me a text if you like. Hey, meanwhile, this week's guest is Them Jeans. He's a popular DJ, producer, podcaster. He's the host of two podcasts, Tall Tales and The Stew. And uh, he's a very tall man. We talk about that at more length than we should on this show. I promise you that. He tells me I look like Ray Romano. And we collectively make fun of Jews, tall people, twins. I try to talk him out of having kids. So you can uh, weigh in on that in the comments if you like and he gives us some important lessons about his career he started out as a doorman at Cinespace and has kind of worked his way up from there into a little bit of international acclaim notoriety so he's going to explain why you shouldn't DJ using Serato if you also like to drink a lot and most importantly uh, some, some great lessons on being willing to suck until you're good and now let's hear from them jeans. <laughs> That's good. I haven't used a ladder in since the eighties. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I'm sure. Well, thanks for being here, man. I'm I'm, ex- I'm excited to to learn more about what you're up to. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I kind of know you as the doorman from Cinespace, and I know you're much more than that, but that's, Mm -hmm. you know, we met when we were doing Loose Tooth yeah, back then, and um, Mm -hmm. and so, you know, I've just sort of been watching your career evolve from afar, and... uh, How far? Way far. (laughs) Really far away. I keep my distance. Yeah, man. I mean, a lot of people know me as the doorman, or they thought I was a bouncer there. Yeah. But I was the one who started it all and is that right it is yeah okay (laughs) i started but i wanted to be at the front to control who was coming in and who wasn't so in order to have my have the party be the best i could make it yeah i had to take a sacrifice and have everybody think i was just a a bouncer no that's great Uh, so i want to hear about that but i so i always like to kind of start at the beginning um yeah so Uh, I'm Jason. Hi, Jason. <laughs> Jason, you're on Rebel Radio. Jason, I'm on Rebel Radio on Kawanga. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Kawanga in the building. Um, yeah, let's start at the beginning. So uh, so you went from doorman to DJ to podcaster and, and I think some other stuff. Tall mm-hmm. guy. You're our tallest guest so far. Damn right. Which is exciting. Can you, can you curse on this? Uh, we require it. <laughs> okay. There, we have a quota. That we Good. Need. This is rebellious. That's right. Shit. Um, yeah. Let's. We're just gonna say shit <laughs> over and over. Um, yeah. That's that's what I've done. So were you always into music? How how'd you get? Always to into this music. Point? I grew up. Being, Where are you from? I grew up in Orange County, okay. California. Which part? Huntington Beach. Oh, that part. The best part. <laughs> is that what it is? The best part of the worst place. Oh, nice best of the worst yeah orange county has a lot of downsides mm. but i grew up in like a a nice little pocket area of huntington beach that wasn't too terrible it still has still had the classic uh kind of vintage charm that it yeah. used to have like back in the 60s and stuff did you grow up surfing i did not grow up surfing i was a little afraid of the ocean too tall it's like center of gravity doesn't work on a board kind of yeah i, I was I don't, I'm not going to make fun of your height the whole time. Cause there's no reason. There's, I can't be offended by being a, a super tall It's just because I'm short. So, I, yeah. you know, we got to go for that. It's like, it's like making fun of a Jewish guy for being rich. Right. It doesn't face him. <laughs> That's right. You're a really tall white guy. Yeah. Could be worse. Yeah, it could be worse. Um, 
Yeah, surfing, skateboarding, I, I was never good at it. Yeah. Because of the equilibrium. Yeah. But very good on a bicycle. Nice. Still, I, I, I ride, I ride to this day all the time. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Grew up there. So. So. And. And. Were oh. you? When did you? really get into music or like be impacted by music um i mean i i was i listened to a lot of music listened to a lot of radio i grew up kind of listening to rock and roll and metal and stuff like that in so the like 80s. k-rock or or can ac oh yeah the knack um so i grew up on a lot of like metallica guns and roses like yeah. the early do you remember the first record you ever bought the first CD I bought with my own money was Use Your Illusion mm -hmm. 2 by Guns N' Roses. And then my twin brother bought Use Your Illusion 1. Nice. So you guys were the Use Your Illusion We're the package twins. deal. Yeah. Yeah, my brother and I, we would always, like, there'd be two CDs that we would think were good. And one person would buy one, one person would buy the other. Nice. And then it would kind of be like, oh, mine is, <laughs> mine is shitty and yours is good. So you win. Are you identical twins? We're not. No. Fraternal. Okay. He's like a foot shorter than me. Okay. Um, looks a lot different. Yeah. He looks more like you. Okay. Actually. I could be your twin brother. He looks a lot like you. I get honest. that a lot. I get people come up to me and say, you know, you could be Jason's twin. You? Ha I mean, yeah, who do people think you look like? Um, they think I look like Adam Goldberg. I get that too. <clears throat> you do? Yeah, I used to get that. More. Hebrew Hammer. Hebrew Hammer. So it really happened when I was uh, when uh, Saving Private Ryan came out. Mm -hmm. And people, in fact, I was at a thing at UCLA. I was, I went to school there, and so I was at like an alumni thing. Mm -hmm. And this guy comes up to me. He's like, "Is it awkward when people recognize you?" And and I was like, uh, "Well, this is awkward." <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I used to get that a lot. I see. So I see a little Ray Romano, maybe. I hear that once in a while. I don't see it, but got a little Ray in there. Okay. Lately, I've been I've been getting stopped at the airport. People thinking uh, I'm actually um, like sports people. Oh yeah. Um, who's the, the the Green Bay quarterback? Green. You guys watch football? Not like that. I mean, <laughs> uh, like you know, when it's on. Uh, oh wait, wait, wait! It's coming to me. No, it's not coming to me. There's I'm, a there's I'm a committed not to. He's a he's like a famous athlete. Famous football player. He's, yeah. He's you can tell this is not a sports <laughs> sports group here, guys. Welcome to the Rebel Radio Sports Show. <laughs> but a lot of people people will stop me really? in the airport and ask me like, "Oh my god!" And some somebody thought I was on Survivor oh, like shit. a month ago. Okay, which is good. Yeah, like I look at myself in the mirror and I'm like, mm. and then they and I see these photos of like, you're like I could be a reality TV you, star. Like I think that you're this like buff, burly, right. like sick dude. Yeah, and I'm not. So that makes me, f I guess I should take that as a yeah, little boost you, you of confidence. I used to get, uh, I talked about this with Newmark on the show, but I used to get confused for two different white hip hop DJs because I was in the <laughs> hip hop business in the 90s. Mm -hmm. And like people would see me out of conferences and like just come running up to me, all excited to see me. And just how have excited the wrong are people person. to see white hip hop DJs though? No, but like truly, I don't know if you know truly. I don't. You know, truly is like a, he's a great LA hip hop DJ. Okay. That's been putting it down here for you know 20 years and people would like had love for him but but not enough to realize that they were talking to me instead mm -hmm. and it was just really like interesting. huge fan but that was back you know 20 years ago we didn't have the google image search that's true we didn't know and what, then there was a guy like. uh, another guy rob one who was also like you know important la hip-hop dj and that one i do now so they would confuse us all the time and then he died mm-hmm and then people would see me out, and I saw a couple people sometimes do like a double take. Wow. Yeah. See, that's a new one. I'm jealous of that one. People thinking that I'm a dead person. It would have been cool to capture that. On Vine? Yeah. We could have <laughs> Vined the hell out of that. <laughs> Ghost of you? <laughs> that's right. Okay. All who, right. What other, who, who other white DJs have you had on this show? On this show? Other than your boy, Them Jeans. So, yeah, Adam12, Newmark, uh, the, Mike, the Mike B., yeah who dj my wedding i love mike b love mike b mm -hmm. um i wish i had that uh mix that he played at my wedding, Your wedding i have no idea man? what he played it was but special. i'm sure it was great just let it be a memory yeah that's right uh oh we had frankie chan on just recently mm. the homie 
Yeah, what, how long have you been doing this pod so we're, for? So we're coming up on a year, once a week. It's hard. Do you have you, fun doing it? Mentioned. Yeah, we're loving it. Is it hard for you? For James, but... You got nervous? No, because I have James. Yeah, I know. But still, even if you have a James, you still gotta, you still gotta man the ship. Oh yeah, that. You gotta prepare. Yeah. You gotta have notes. Yeah. Or or not. No, or I do. It. I I don't. I I decided not to. I used to write them down and have cards with me, and I just kind of found it distracting. It can be. So now I and I've heard on one of your shows, I heard you mention the notes, and so I'm curious. Maybe you can coach me a little bit <laughs> on this. I show. can coach you. Yeah. yeah. Just instead of writing down notes, just maybe get like ten bullet points. Yeah. Little little one, two word thingies. So I was doing stickies for a while, post-it mm -hmm. notes. That's you can never trademark. let your guests see what the notes are. Yeah. If you have a laptop, <clears throat> even better. Oh, yeah? So, you do, you, so is that how you do it? Well, I have the laptop open because I'm recording it, yeah. so that's my excuse. But then right. I can hide oh, a little, uh, I can hide whatever I want. Yeah. I can do a secret Google if I want. Nice. Mm -hmm. Quiet types. Yeah. I like that. No, I just, I kind of go, I do, you know, as much research as I can, and then I go off the dome, mm -hmm. and we see where it takes us. I love off the dome, except I forget everything. <laughs> Have you ever done it drunk or stoned? No, I don't drink or smoke, so it takes all the fun out. Just the coffee? Yeah. Just the That's all I got left. Good. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I'm always like, I should let the coffee go. But For I'm listeners like, at home, you can see a tear dripping <laughs> from his eye as he said, coffee is all he has left. Yeah, because I've, you know... Cause I want to not drink coffee too, but I need I got I need like I need, need advice. Yeah, you vape? No, <laughs> <laughs> I don't do any of that. Do you do you like spend your money on useless stuff? Well, you I'm have married like a, and I have a kid. Hey, so. Say no more. <laughs> I got a couple of useless things. I got a wife and a kid, but you don't you don't have like a a side hobby that you dump a bunch of money and time into, like yeah, you're, fixing up you're, an old car or something like that. No. <clears throat> Good for you. Maybe you should get something like that. I have more bikes than I need. Yeah? And more records than I need. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But Ma maybe you should like... start getting into garage sales. Oh, that's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> Your that's wife a, will be happy. That's a strong one. No, she's she's kind of worse than I am at it. Really? All this, yeah. This podcast is all about you and your um, <laughs> your private family Apparently. life. <laughs> Apparently. I like how you turn the tables on this. Uh-huh. We're going to talk about your child only for the next 48 minutes. <laughs> That's going to be fascinating. How's the school Radio. system going? Oh, man. All right. You don't have kids. No kids. All right, then. We're not going to talk. But I want to have kids. Do you? Yeah. Is that uh, is that the plan? With That is the plan. Yeah. To have a child in, you know, in, in the next few years. Yeah. Not in a huge rush, but not, not in a rush. Yeah, you're, 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 you're a young man. Take your time. I don't want to take my time too much. I okay. still want to be able to romp, romp around with my child. You know, it's a trip, and, and, and I don't want to make this about kids, but uh, rebel kids. <laughs> but we had we had kids. We had our son kind of late, like you know, end of our thirties, mm -hmm. and uh, so now we're in kindergarten, or he's in kindergarten, but mm -hmm. we are there on a regular basis, and all the parents are our age. Yeah, and we're in Venice, and it's times like, are changing. It's crazy. And in a few years, everyone, I mean, especially in LA and Hollywood where everyone is like working towards their dream yeah. and, it, and it takes yeah. longer and longer to do that. It's very regular to have like 54 year old dad taking your kid to kindergarten yeah, because you've been working your whole life and you yeah, can't yeah. take the time or you just, you just give up. <laughs> right, <laughs> and you're like, well, I'm, I'm not gonna be a fucking. I got a couple friends like I'm not that, gonna be Tiesto, sure. so I might as well have this fucking kid. <laughs> oh, like that? I thought you meant give up on the kids. <laughs> no, no, right. never give up on the children. I agree. Never give up on the rebel children. That's right. But yeah, after a while, you have to you have to pull the plug. There's yeah. no perfect time to have a child. I'm no. assuming. So you just gotta no, do it. No, unless you you know cash out your startup or. Mm, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Unless you get like very rich right and don't care about doing stuff in but the then world. do you want a kid because you got all this fun shit Dude. to do with all that money it's weird because i just my girlfriend and i just got a puppy a yeah. few months ago and there's a lot of that like you experience all the pros of oh, having an animal totally and it's fun and it brings you joy but then it's a, it really handicaps your life yeah you can't just fuck off for for a week somewhere you can't fuck off you yeah. can't have like a zanny weekend <laughs> yeah not so much <laughs> no that dog needs a walk the dog needs a walk i mean all that stuff but food then when you have the child it's really it's really yeah. tough and then you yeah. also have to 
kind of you and your wife or your partner whoever you're raising this child with have to like a lot of the uh the fun and mystique and romance goes away because you're For sure you're like here we here we go we're gonna spreadsheet out our life <laughs> and from two to five there's this and seven to eight <laughs> is this and then we have to the, so this. crazy so then there's no you, you, all the smoke and mirrors are gone yeah it's tough yeah that's the it's a full-time job game. it is the game and but we're for what it. And for what? Maybe I'm not going to have kids. <laughs> I'm here to talk you out of it. This is an intervention. Playboy for life. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, let's go back to Huntington. Okay, let's go back to Huntington. Uh, and we're, we're, we're rocking out with uh, Guns N' Roses. Yeah, we're, we're, we're rocking out with Guns N' Roses. We're enjoying metal. And we're getting into some punk rock. Okay. We're getting into some what, early hip hop. What got you into punk rock? Just kind of growing up in the neighborhood. Like, you would... You would hear about the mainstream music first, yeah, because it'd be on the radio or on MTV or whatever. Yeah, and then like somebody's neighbor's older brother would have like this cassette of this one band, and then you get into it. Sure. And then I grew up getting into like hardcore music and straight mm -hmm. edge, kind of punk rock stuff. Nice. What was it well, like? Was there a record that like turned the corner for um, you? I mean, it was kind of. It was probably like the early 90s, like 93, mm. 94. And I started getting into, there's uh, like bands like Gorilla Biscuits, mm. which is like an old classic New York hardcore band. Yeah. And then from there, just kind of the whole world of hardcore music exploded. And it was, it was a big thing in the 90s. And then all through high school, I was into it. And then I started getting into a lot of hip hop just because it was on the radio in LA all the time. Yeah. And then same thing, like somebody's neighbor's friend would have like the chronic mm -hmm. on cassette and your mom wouldn't let you have it. So then you go to their house and listen to it and be sure. like, oh, sick. And then you'd burn a, burn a CD of it. Yeah. Or you'd find, find it on Napster or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, yeah, just, you know, white suburban people are into hip hop more than anyone else in the world, you know? Yeah. They got a be a badass and stuff oh that still freaks me out a little bit but i get it <laughs> yeah no the it. biggest hip-hop heads in the world are just white nerdy jewish dudes yeah in in my experience yeah no it's true it's true and and i you know it's it's just like it's where i think peace about it <laughs> i'm on it <laughs> you're um, you're living proof bro you're in it are you jewish i am jewish but i'm not suburban oh i grew up like we were the only City boy. Yeah, city boy in San, from San Francisco, and we were, like, the only white family. Well, San Francisco is so mixed that we weren't the only ones, but, you know, it was predominantly yeah. black neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So, so for me, hip-hop, like, is sort You're, of synonymous with with black culture. Yeah. And at least, you know, and, and so, but I realize that's not true for millions of hip-hop fans. Oh, it still is. Well, it is in a lot of ways, but but I think the experience you're talking about is probably more common. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like I said, I, we were the only family, you know, around pretty much. And what neighborhood is this? In uh, Fillmore District, mm -hmm. kind of Hayes Valley, mm -hmm. home of uh, JT the bigger figure. Sure. And see, only white Jewish guys know who <laughs> JT the bigger figure is. That's right. <laughs> Wait, so I have a test. Uh, let me see if it, we're gonna test this out. Favorite hip hop album of all time? Ooh, that's really hard. Well, the problem with me is I don't have a favorite anything. Okay, good. I've, I'm, I respect it. It's that. constantly evolving, but I've had a lot of moments with hip hop. I mean, like, you know, from like the first Wu Tang record. Mm -hmm. I mean, The Chronic was huge. The Chronic 2001 may have been even more huge for me. Wow. Okay. Because that's that came out when I was old enough to do pot. Yeah. Because the first Chronic. I was just a young buck in the right. game. I was just getting into like firecrackers and <laughs> and like <laughs> internet porn. But then, sure. <laughs> when the Chronic 2001 comes out, you're old enough to like get weed, which to smoke to this record. Yeah, yeah. The smoking record. What a world we live in where internet porn predates weed. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. That's big. Write that yeah, down. Very different. For, for <laughs> um, well, no, that's I, I appreciate that answer because because the. Um, Someone told me years ago that uh, every white guy's favorite rap record is is uh, or favorite rap group is Tribe Called Quest, like hip hop, oh. white, like white hip hop head. 
It and, could be. But but I'm glad to. You maybe know. that's some white guilt. <laughs> I mean, I there's, there's but also like you know, I think a, a big white. White man's hip hop album was Deltron 3030. Yeah, for sure. That was a huge like every yeah. every bro was like, yeah, this is fucking sick hip hop. <laughs> it's like different, you know. Right. A little yeah. There's a lot of that going on. Yeah. But I could see the Tribe Called Quest thing being, but it's it's like I never really got into Tribe Called Quest that much just yeah. because it was a little before my time mm-hmm. to be in that that like you need to be like. And a young adult teenager right. in like the early nineties to really yeah. to really feel that flow. I was just like eight years old watching Martin and being right. sort of into it. Like yeah. I'm feeling it, but nice. It was before you know. Yeah. I don't have any leather baseball jerseys or stuff like that. You need to go get one. Mm. <laughs> for your next set. <laughs> hey, what well, um so were you thinking music was a career at, at this at any point in this in yeah i think I, I i really wanted to get into music and i and i was a big fan and i like my mom got me a guitar i started playing guitar i, I played bass a little bit but i never really took it that seriously yeah kind of fucked around with some friends and did a, a few little musical things like jamming out in the garage kind of mm-hmm. thing Did you ever play a show <sighs> not really with a band <laughs> well i mean i i've played with in other people's bands okay just like a little one-off thing you hear in there but mm-hmm never really i never like had a, a band of my own yeah um but then then when like napster and digital downloading first started coming around i would be all into that and i started getting into weird in electronic music some kind of like experimental stuff coming from like what a, does that mean it was like like what's a record like apex twin and square okay. pusher and mm-hmm. like that's kind of, like if you're coming from like a hardcore punk rock background, yeah. you're not going to be like I fucking love trance music. I'm going to get into this. Like yeah. you, you're you sort of get the weird uh-huh. kind of fucked up, glitchy yeah. stuff that is exciting to you as like a young a young man mm-hmm. who doesn't like isn't into deep house just quite yet. Mm-hmm. So got into that. Got into a lot of like weird like kind of. I don't know. Just, I I just kept digging deeper, and I, it was, like the internet was kind of popping, and you could like finally get music on the internet yeah. from like what like a website will just post a MP3, and you can download it from this blog. And mm-hmm. then I started getting into more and more all different kinds of electronic music, and then that sort of took over. But now I'm now I'm, I'm into everything. Sure, and I play it all. Yeah. But that then from there I was able to start DJing. And then getting getting into production, getting some software, and making making music on my own. Yeah, which I which I still do. What was the first DJ gig? First DJ gig. First DJ gig I ever had was in I I believe it was a friend's house party. Mm-hmm. Classic first DJ gig. Sure. And it was not it was not very good for sure. I, I was it was like half of it when I first started DJing. I would do like half of it on vinyl. Mm-hmm. And then all the songs that I did not have on vinyl, I would have on an iPod, <laughs> and I would play those. Right. So it was kind of like having a little backup. Sure. And that's before, you know, pitch shifting and all that stuff, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This just is just like, a straight up iPod yeah. that I would like, boo, uh-huh. with the record and then hit play on an iPod and right. like drop some, like the new cool hip hop song uh-huh. that I did not have on vinyl or it, maybe it wasn't out yet or something like that. Yeah. And then I got Serato after that. And then I had Serato for a long time, and then I did not anymore. And now I'm just on, on USBs. Oh, really? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, man. I couldn't do Serato anymore. Why? It has a lot of downsides for me. It's I don't like to have to carry around a very special, important laptop mm-hmm. on a drunken adventure until 5 in the morning. Yeah. Especially if you're traveling abroad, it's just sure. kind of like, you know, we're going to go to this after party and we're going to go here. And then yeah. you have to like carry this backpack full of all of your shit right. all night long. So that, that part's annoying. And then like forgetting your power cord at the club mm. and just, you know, every every month you would spend $300 in needles, mm-hmm. power cords, Serato, this and that. There's always something wrong. And then it's just, it's kind of like... uh the staring at the screen thing and not really feeling the music and engaging with the crowd got to be a little bit of a bummer interesting and then so i I just got the usbs and now that 
it's it's pretty easy you can have all your music on there organize it with record box and mm-hmm. then i can just show up with a usb stick if i forget at the club it's fine it was nine dollars yeah sure I could leave it in my pocket and DJ whenever I want. And then right. you're you're mixing with your ears again, like how you used to when you played on vinyl. Yeah. And you have more fun. You feel it. Yeah. You you have to concentrate more on what you're doing instead of just kind of going into DJ autopilot, which a lot of people do on Serato. Yeah. Unfortunately. Did you have like, uh, you know, did somebody like introduce you to DJing or help like mentor you as you're starting out or did you just... <clears throat> no, well, I, I started throwing the party um, at Cinespace. That was your first on the Tuesdays club adventure. First club adventure. Really? So I started I started working there on a random random situation, like working in the office. I was mm-hmm. covering. I needed a job. I had just moved to LA. I didn't have any money, and I got a job answering telephones in the office at that club for a week while the other guy was at Burning Man. <laughs> <laughs> very classic sorry <laughs> and then i i did apparently i did such a good job just kind of like this guy's burning up the phones i mean i'm not that great at answering phones i'm fine at it but like i would kind of i was breathing a little life into the office yeah. they're kind of in a rut and i was like okay. i was like the young hip guy could be like don't do that shit do this this is tight that's fucked up don't right. do, you know, this is all whack and then the the guy came back they they made like a little position like assistant event coordinator for me and nice. then I noticed on the calendar there was nothing ever on a Tuesday. So I started just saying, like, let's do a party on Tuesday. Yeah. And then it kind of snowballed from there. And then had Aoki and Frankie Chan come on and, and be the DJs. And then it blew up really big. How'd and, you how'd you meet those guys? Um, I met them just from them coming to my party. Yeah. Because we, we had initial, initially there were two DJs that were like the residents on there. And then Steve and Frankie had just started DJing and mm-hmm. around town, like little gigs here and there. And then I hired, I was like, hey, do you guys want to be the DJs for this party every week? And they said, sure. And I think we, you know, I think I gave them 200 bucks a week or something like that. And then as it got bigger, I started seeing all of the people come in and do guest DJ sets. And I, and I thought that they sucked. Mm-hmm. And if... I can at least do as good as this, if not better, and then I don't have to give them all this money every week. Yeah. I'm not talking about Steve or Frankie. I'm just, right, talking, right, right. just like, hey, we got to yeah. have this random person from this band, and we're going to give them right. 500 bucks to do a guest DJ set, Yeah, and it's going to bring all these people, and then I'd see them play, and they just were like horrible. So was this fucking awesome at the time? Or no, this was Cinespace Tuesdays. Okay. Yeah, I never, I never was a part of the the fucking awesome oh, party. Okay, I I DJed it a couple of times. Yeah, but I I, I didn't. But that wasn't that it. party, right? Okay, just Sin and Space Tuesdays. No. Just Sin and Space Tuesdays. Okay. Yeah, that was that was the and then and w- and what was the um, you know Frankie was on and he talked a little bit about like, you know the vision that they had for, for fucking awesome, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you know I'm curious about like when you started doing this party, was there a like was there a plan? There was, was not. It? There was not a plan. It was literally. It came out of necessity of like, there's nothing ever on a Tuesday on the calendar. Yeah. So at the very least, we can just have a couple bros play records. Mm-hmm. People can come up and chill and smoke some cigs in the in the smoking patio. Mm-hmm. We'll all get fucked up and have a good time. And then every week, more and more people started coming, and it was kind of like the cool underground place. Yeah. And for like six months, it existed under completely under the radar, and we would have crazy guests come DJ, and like Interpol would come, and like all the like every week, mm-hmm. and just hang out there and not talk to anyone. Like all these crazy band people and celebs would come, yeah, and like Brian, like the Brian Jonestown Massacre, okay. like they would DJ yeah. just randomly. Yeah. Ariel Pink would come and DJ, just weird kind of all these all these big musicians who are popular now would just come and everyone smelled bad it was still kind of like the rock and roll turns right. into electronic music yeah. phase yeah kind of right before like lcd sound system and mastercraft and all that mm-hmm. stuff happened so everyone was still like into indie rock mm-hmm. and everyone had long hair and smelled and was wearing leather leather pants and stuff yeah. the smell seems to be pretty important in this <laughs> the smell was bad man <laughs> It was it was a bummer. A lot of people smelled bad in the early two thousands. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're learning history. 
Oh, yeah, shit. but the, the, there was no vision, like because I like I didn't even know the music that these guys were playing. I was like, "You guys are the DJs, just do your shit." Yeah, I didn't know if it was good or bad or not. Yeah, you guys make the flyer. I didn't know what I'm doing, and then I slowly started getting into graphic design and doing all of my own flyers, and I started getting into music and DJing yeah. my own my own you, stuff like that. Are you the artist? Like I see a lot of your stuff has a like illustrative style. Yeah, now, I mean, like I'm I'm that, I'm very into graphic design. Yeah. I don't really do it anymore, except for fun here and there. Mm -hmm. But there was a time where I was doing a lot of a lot of stuff and making a lot of flyers for events and kind of random little one-off gigs, mm -hmm. designing stuff. And I grew up being into graffiti a lot, so that was kind oh, of cool. the the typography background. What did you What did you write? Jeans. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's how. Yeah, that's how I got my DJ name. <coughs> Where did the name come from? No, it didn't come from anywhere. Just like all graffiti names, they don't really yeah. make sense. It sure. just kind of it pops into your head and you like the way the letters may work together. But mm -hmm. now there's a guy, a graffiti writer currently who writes jeans, who has a like a similar style to what I'm into. So do you guys have to battle? I don't no, is we're that, not gonna battle. Is that coming up? <laughs> I wish it was coming up. I wanna be friends with him uh, because yeah. I feel like if this guy's into like all this weird shit like I'm into we have the same graffiti name and like uh, similar styles. Yeah. Maybe we are like long lost friends. Maybe it's a girl. Might be another twin. And maybe it's my third twin. <laughs> but uh, it happens. I have not I have not painted graffiti in a long time. So yeah. this current jeans will probably really blaze me no problem. Okay. But I could So if they're looking for jeans, don't don't come arrest you. Yeah. Is what you're saying. Exactly. You're not that guy. Yes. I, I like haven't jeans illegally in a long time. <laughs> <laughs> nice this guy sounds made up he's real check the instagram oh? mm -hmm. yeah. if you know the graffiti writer named jeans have him send me a dm well he definitely listens to this show of course, so uh, of course. jeans call in jeans call in. you got the number wait do you guys get calls uh y no okay not at all <laughs> we don't classic classic atlantic records baby nope, <laughs> we haven't got no the phones aren't the, the we phones have phones are lighting but they, up they ain't on they're blowing up right now Sometimes James just texts me to pretend that uh, something's happening. <laughs> it's just a fake thing. So I love the fact that you, um, the way you describe it, you like, you know, no offense. Like you didn't really know what you were doing. You just do it anyway. Yeah, absolutely. Is that, um, like, it has, is that just the way you get down or like? I think so, yeah. yeah. I think that the best way to learn something that you're into is to just get in at the bottom and start doing it yeah um i think a lot of people might disagree with that but well they're wrong <laughs> they Fuck might them. be wrong yeah. but you know like if you're into if you're I'm like i'm really into food and cooking for instance yeah and a lot of people if they want to be a chef one day and run their own restaurant they think like oh i have to go to culinary school and spend right you know 75 grand on tuition and yeah. go there for three years and live in a different state and then when I'm out, I'll be able to just go walk up to any restaurant and get a sick ass job. Sure, but but it I, it doesn't really work that way. Whether you go to school or not, you you kind of start at the bottom. Yeah, wherever you go, like same for the music biz. Like I went to USC for music right. business, and they're yeah. like, all right, great, get in line. Here's the f here's the mail room. Yeah, and you can start emptying out my trash can. And then in three years, I'm I'll let you be the guy who drives the fucking van or something you know right. you, st you have to start at the you have to start at the bottom because yeah. whether or not you are learned you're still like a 22 year old dumb dumb yeah sure at the, at the at the end of the day so yeah i'm just always like oh podcasting i like podcasting it seems pretty cool i'm just gonna start it up and yeah. see what happens yeah. or djing i'm gonna go to amoeba hit the dollar bin get some shitty turntables on Craigslist mm -hmm. and just see what, you know, give it a shot, give it a try. And it's, it's fun. Well, I mean, I love that. And, you know, sorry to go back to being a parent, but like, don't full but, circle, but that's like, you know, I mean, I find myself, you know, trying to teach my son that is like, like you're going to be shitty at stuff until you're good at it mm -hmm. and you have to be willing to do that. Right. Like, um, and for me, like, you know, I was, tough. I am, uh, I'm not a DJ, but I've, I've, uh, you've I've, dabbled. Yeah. Like I've, I've played some parties, 
Mm-hmm. And you've been around the scene. But you know, it, well, I've definitely been around the scene, and that was uh, that was kind of a, a hindrance to me as a DJ because I was hyper aware of how much I sucked, mm. and it really bothered me. And so, like one of the first gigs I played, um, I was like opening for the Beat Junkies, mm. and then I was like in, in a bowling tough. alley, which I don't know why they were playing in a bowling alley. But you know, there used I, to be some tight parties in bowling alleys. But I get home, I was like, I had so so much more fun listening to them. Than actually DJing yourself, but I was in love with the idea that, of of DJing. You yeah, know I, mean? I think. But I then think I was it, like, "Fuck, that sucked." And you know, it's it's, it's a lot. It, it it can help you and hurt you. If if you and your five friends in high school all start DJing at the same time, you yeah. all suck at the same time, and you kind of come up, and each person go, grows and yeah. h- better than others. Like that's a lot easier to sure. grasp on. But if you grow up with one person who's super good, and you're willing to you're okay with that. You could probably learn a lot more. Right. Like, you know, they say like, you 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 don't like like for playing tennis or something. For instance, like you you don't get better unless you play someone better. Yeah. You have to be you have to open for the beat junkies to to let yourself know like holy shit I need to go practice or like I have no business DJing right now. <laughs> right. Yeah. That kind but, of thing. But it's that it's that I think right is that like I have no business but I'm just gonna do it anyway. Mm-hmm. And I'm gonna keep going until I have, yeah. you know, some business to have it. a little self confidence. Yeah. Be like, you know what, I, I I was good enough to have them ask me to open for them. Yeah. So I got that going for me. Yeah. You gotta crawl before you can walk, baby. Yeah, I like it. Take it on the chin. <laughs> Take all your shitty life experiences on the chin. That I love that. Are you? Um, so was was Cinespace like? That's a game changer. It was a game right? changer. Like, you know, club blows up. I think you know for that scene that you're talking about, the indie kind of meets mm-hmm. electro. Like that was kind of the epicenter at the time in L.A. Yeah, at least probably in America. Yeah, it was like the it was something that I didn't realize was going on, but everyone, you know, people would we would have DJs come from all over the country and be like, I can't believe I'm here, man. Like it's it's yeah. like Shea Stadium or something like that, yeah, like yeah. this mythical place where. Yeah legendary things go down was there like a, a best night or like a highlight that mm. we, like was there a time when you 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 left the club going fuck we really got something yeah absolutely i mean probably the the biggest one of all time was when we had daft punk dj and i think i don't think there's ever going to be better bigger than that sure because that was like the first daft punk dj set in i don't know since the 90s yeah more than not just doing like a crazy live thing and that right. was that was big that was like worldwide Huge. news like yeah. it was on you know it was crazy an uh, an unmasked daft punk is djing at a club for 500 people mm-hmm. and that was that was insane that was probably like the the oh shit moment where yeah. where i rode my bike home with the pocket full of 20s high on life <laughs> king of the world nice mm-hmm that's amazing, man. Those those nights, I you know, I remember, I remember those nights in in the club. Business. Yeah, man. Like, yeah. It was it was cool. Like everyone, it, since it was a weekly party, it was hard because managing a weekly party with world class talent every single Tuesday, yeah, is a full time job. Sure, super hard. So yeah. there'd be some kind of off nights, but then the on nights were really, really on. And then yeah. it was such a big thing that tour agencies and booking agencies would route their LA mm-hmm. shows to be near Tuesdays instead of a Friday or a Saturday which right. would be the normal the normal booking. Yeah. It's tight. So does that change for you like you know like we just said you're you're sort of just doing it there's not really an expectation and then you know then you have Daft Punk and you have booking agents mm-hmm. you know routing around you like does that you know I imagine it's more exciting but there's also more pressure now to like yeah. live up to that it's exciting it's a lot of pressure and it, it was the three of us me and steve and frankie and they they kind of were managing their own businesses sure you know they had and their fighting. own record labels <laughs> we, yeah i mean they, yeah. they were like we know they like to fight they like to fight yes yeah. but you know they each each of those guys like they have their record label yeah. their brand then yeah. So I was the one who was kind of like running the show because I was the one who had the time to right. do it. So I kind of managed everything and I did a lot of the booking stuff and they helped bring stuff in as well, but I kind of had to run the show. Mm-hmm. So I was not used to that type of administrative work sure, at all. Sure. So I sort of had to like just teach myself and manage myself, which not that great. 
So do you approach it differently when it's like the stakes, you know, are higher versus like, I'm just going to do this? Yeah, and- definitely. I mean, when you, when the stakes are higher, when, you know, there's money on the line, you, you're, in, you're investing in, in a talent to come play and you have, you know, you have to sell tickets and you have to sell alcohol and, mm-hmm. or otherwise you're coming out of pocket that day. Right. It could, you know, it could be a rainy day and nobody's going to come to your party like you. It's a lot of a lot of stress, a lot of pressure. I definitely had a lot of nights where, you know, I just couldn't I didn't have enough money to pay DJs and, Mm -hmm. you know, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And we'd have to, like, chase them down and give them 200 bucks two weeks later. You know, yeah, it's it's very stressful, but I learned so much so quick. I learned I'm, you know, I, I became friends with every booking agent. I had relationships with everyone. I knew how the game went. I I really learned the art of negotiating. Mm-hmm. I kind of, unfortunately, I know so much about this business that's kind of like a shitty business, like the whole clubbing world. Right. Like it's very looked down upon by modern society, and it's unless you're like a young person or you live in Europe. Right. Like it's a little like it's not taken that seriously. There's a lot more dignified paths to take in this world, sure. but it's unfortunately something that I know everything about. I don't know how I can flip that into some sick retirement. Well, I mean, I think it's really interesting. Um, you know, I was I was in the club business in the '90s, and um, in fact, our biggest night that I ever had was a Tuesday. I think there's, first of all, I think there's some about Tuesdays. Some about a Tuesday. Yeah, because it is a slow night. Right. And, and so, you know, mm. we always had that approach, like, you it's know, the, it's for the, doing the career party. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's good. Tuesday night brings out the rich people. Right. And the shitty people who don't have jobs. Yeah. And those two groups tend to like to hang out together. Yeah. 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 Which is the shitty, the shitty bros get to have sex with the rich white girls. Right. That they normally would not be able to from, yeah. from Beverly Hills. And then those girls get to sleep with the skeezy dudes living on the east side it's a dream come true it was magic baby <laughs> and then all the people in the middle who have jobs are just like no i'm i'm, I'm going to go to highlands on saturday and right. pass out and that's it right but i think to some extent you know or there's some some of those people wish they could have that other life mm-hmm. you know absolutely um and so i don't know i mean I, I i get your point about you know the club business is definitely like slimy mm-hmm. but um but it's also, you know, there's something about it that, you know, you are touching people emotionally. Mm-hmm. And, Absolutely. Um, and I also think just the, the weekly nature of a club, right? Like it's, you know, it keeps you, for me at least, you know, it keeps you really centered because, you know, you have this great night where there's magic in the air and you made some money and everyone had a great time and people are like mm-hmm. freaking out at how much fun they had. And yet in six days you got another one. Mm-hmm. Right, and that magic is going to disappear really fast if next week sucks. Yeah, absolutely. Or if you lose money or or whatever, right? So I think there's something. I mean, we're having that with this show, right? Like, you know, we got to get up tomorrow and start working on next week. Yeah, you know, no matter whether this is any good or not. Mm-hmm. Luckily, in this case, but um, thank God the show is a good one. Right, <laughs> carry us. Thank fucking this God. Will, uh, um, yeah, that was that was definitely a, a, when you're doing a weekly party. And you have the same people coming every week. It, yeah. it is it is kind of like you're responsible for like a church like situation. It's you know these people need this release. Yeah. They have whatever is going on with their life. They can leave it at the door and they could come, and they know they're gonna get free Svedka from ten to eleven, and they're gonna be able to smoke cigs over Svedka. here. Yeah. They can do coke over here. They can hear their favorite song yeah. that they don't get to hear at any other club. And they get to just go insane until two in the morning. Yeah. And that's exactly what they needed. And it's what they look forward to every week. And they thank, they thank me when they come in, they Mm -hmm. thank me when they leave. And it's like a, it's like an, it it was like a very nice little church like situation. Yeah. You're like the deacon. Mm Mm-hmm. I don't know what that is. And much like the church, I'm Jewish. We all the money coming in is under the table. Right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's the best. That's the best part of it. Nothing but fives in the collection jar, baby. So all the uh, entrepreneurs out there, start a business that runs on cash. <clears throat> yeah. Start is, a start a start the, something that you could say is a church or right. a religion. Yeah, you get good tax breaks, right? You get all of them, bro. Yeah. Nice. Shout out! Shout out to religion in the building. 
<laughs> uh, tax advice from them jeans mm. on Rebel Radio. Yeah, you don't want that. <laughs> so, like, do offers start coming in, or, or at what point do you start thinking about what's the next move? Um, I started when when the club was going really well. I started DJing, and I started having myself be a resident DJ instead of working at the door, so yeah. I could get some damn respect. Yeah, <laughs> finally. No, but I love that. Just to go back on that, like I, I used to do the same thing. I used to be at the door. Mm-hmm. You know, I alternated. Like sometimes I would have a table in the back and like entertain my VIPs or whatever. Mm-hmm. And you know, there there's something to that. But sure. But I all I found a lot of value in standing out front and seeing who comes in, mm-hmm. having some say over that, having that interaction with people, like you said, absolutely getting feeding that energy. I've met a lot of people over the years who are still friends to this day who are were dork ass little kids with fake IDs who mm-hmm. would never get into any club in LA. Yeah. Let alone this one which was like the the hot one to be in and for whatever reason I would let them in just because I thought they were nice or they were Yeah. They would they would be a, a fine addition to the club instead of all the other people coming in. Sure. And those are people I'm still friends with to this day. They're all successful and they're and they're thankful to me that I let them in that kind of thing like yeah you really need to if you want to be if you want to be really successful in the club game you have to control your crowd mm-hmm. and it has to be very specific and it's not just like the cool hot people and no fat poor people like you have to just know what is who's what's going to make a good vibe and it's yeah. a little bit of everything yeah and if you're able to be out there and, and hand select who can do it and who can't do it you can really Get, get something good going it doesn't even matter what music you're playing as, right. as long as the perfect crowd is inside and there's alcohol yeah you can you can do it all night yeah and that has to line up with your vision right because <clears throat> you know Brent Boldhouse is going to have a different mm-hmm. criteria for who he lets in absolutely to his clubs right because he's trying to do something different mm-hmm. and you know and your thing and, and and that's like I, I like you know I like saying that it, it all has to line up yeah it has to uh, people of a similar mental energy and yeah. and good vibrations no no boners no douches right and bring let some fat people in let some dorky people in let the wheelchair guy in all that stuff okay it has to happen yeah and because those people are going to be so thankful yeah and they're going to have a great time yeah. they're going to spend money they're going to be respectful mm-hmm. and everyone's going to have a, have a good time that's the way it should be but you have to still be a, like these guys are bad right don't let them in yeah these chicks are bad don't let them in yeah and it's fun to do that yeah sure it's fun to nine people and then it's I'm even sure it more is. fun when they give you a hundred dollars to get in and then you're like okay that's fine <laughs> win-win baby <laughs> i love it okay so um <clears throat> then then your so your your dj career is kind of born out of that DJ career is born out of that. Yeah. Started um, getting booked for other stuff, traveling around, touring around. And that was really, really fun. Very exciting to kind of come up from not much and then have people flying you around and buying you hotels and giving yeah. you drinks and taking you out to dinner. It's great. DJ life, if you can pull it off, is a very comfortable, relaxing in entertaining way to live is there a downside to it there there is a downside to it um i mean djing is one of those it's it's definitely a young man's game Mm. it has a shelf life at a point you know every dj kind of hangs up hangs up the hat at a certain point and after that you know what do you do Hopefully you saved your money and you can invest in something. There's definitely the one DJ who's DJing too late into his life, still holding on to the dream. Right. Um, you know, there's there's ways that you can kind of finesse and go into a different lane afterwards. So when you start thinking about that as a career, were there people that like gave you some game that like took yeah. you under their wing or, or I, w- you? I would say um you know, when I started DJing, a- DJ AM was the one where yeah. I would go to wherever he was playing. I would just go and sit there in, in the DJ booth, mm-hmm. and he would just let me watch him p- 
play all night mm -hmm. and it would you know i'd be in a, a bolt a bolt house club yeah somewhere and paris hilton would be throwing a bottle of patron at some other girl and you know everyone was there it was it was the it was a hollywood crazy scene but i had no place i had no place being there but then once i started doing the cinespace party and it was popping off then they suddenly started letting me in there mm -hmm. and i would just sit in the in the booth with am and watch him and that was and he was you know he basically inspired me to dj how i dj today yeah and he you know he definitely definitely he was the best to do it is there anything specific that he taught you um we kind of i mean we would kind of teach each other a little little bit here and there like obviously he doesn't need to learn any djing tips from me but like i was he was really into sort of doing the quick mixes mm -hmm. genre jumping wordplay yep. all those kind of dj tricks mm -hmm. and and he was super good at it and you know and then mixing like you know a rock and roll song with a hip hop beat or whatever that whatever that is and he'd mm -hmm. be doing it all on vinyl with before serato or any of that stuff so it was very impressive but then so i would i would really try to do that and in, in like the whole mashup culture was really big back then and it was yeah. it was starting it was, sure. before it was like a cheesy overblown right. thing it was actually really cool like the z trip mm -hmm. mixtapes were coming out and it was really awesome to hear like him doing some live crazy mashup like it was interesting yeah so everyone was really into that and i i, I was into that so i would try to do weird mixes but i would show am like instead of doing a quick mix like just do a really long one and just have your your fingers on each of the of the turntable mm -hmm. knobs coming out and you're just riding it you know adjusting adjusting the tempo yeah and just to see how it's kind of like uh kind of like surfing mm -hmm. like there's the guys who you'd go up and do one trick on a wave and then there's the guy who's like i'm gonna ride this one for a three minutes like the longest ride ever yeah you know some people are into sniping some people are into stabbing sure a little bit of, but like oh and and he would be like how do you like why are you doing this for so long and then i would always say like when you if you play two songs together that go well together for a long time like you can stumble upon something that you may have never heard like yeah two minutes and 87 seconds into it these magical things collide and you just you heard you heard a piece of sound that's never been heard before mm -hmm. and it sounded amazing and make sure you go home and write it down and try to remember that so the next time you play they'll be like holy shit he was playing these two songs and at this moment it turns into like a new explosion of amazingness yeah and then that that can help you set yourself apart from a standard dj mm -hmm. as long as the crowd is open-minded yeah and you don't suck at DJing. <laughs> <laughs> That's the hard part. That's the hard part. You have to know your uh, you have to know your limitations and your sure. strengths. Yeah. If you can do it, do it. That's what the people want to see. You got you know every every DJ is so boring. So if you're able to do something that's cool and, and that doesn't involve standing on top of a turntable or doing you know pumping it up mm -hmm. with a with a heart heart fingers right. And you know, doing a backflip or is whatever that, your, that is. Is that going to be your new style? <clears throat> it's my old style. Okay, it, but it's more. It's, I say it's more fun to impress them with what you're actually doing, instead of a cartwheel or something. I mean, some some DJs, uh, if we can call them that, seem to be. Uh, doing, How dare you? Doing just fine with that. Absolutely, because the majority of the public are dum dums, mm. and they don't know or care. Yeah. But uh, you know, dum dums are fine. But it's possible to exist without Someone's having... gotta pay a hundred dollars to get in the club. Someone someone does, yeah. yeah. I'm okay with I'm okay with being you could still live comfortably and respect yourself and what you're doing. Well you know, if you work hard at it mm -hmm. and you're talented mm -hmm. and you care about what you're doing. You don't have to just make shit. To, for shitty people and then have a cool car and be rich <laughs> yeah sure bad way to live how do you you can't I wouldn't be able to sleep at night knowing that I'm whack <laughs> how do, do think, whack people sleep at night do you think do you whack think, people don't know they're whack do you think that's the thing like, too self aware yeah I don't think people know they're whack ignorance is bliss and I think you know you have people around you that tell you that you're not whack 
Yeah, I'm too um, hyper sensitive. Yeah, hyper vigilant about the world around me. Nice. We'll nice. Get, we'll get the dictionary out. Is it that. nice? <laughs> um, all right. So, so tell us about the food thing. Um, yeah, the food thing. I've I've just always been into food and cooking my whole life. I grew up watching food TV shows. Wait, like you're watching Emerald. I watch a little Emerald. I watch a okay. lot of Good Eats with Alton Brown. Oh yeah, okay. I kind of learned a lot about food and cooking from him. Mm-hmm. Kind of the the scientific side of things. Yeah, a little more logical, pragmatic way of of doing things instead of just bam. Mm. To quote the Emerald, and then I I, I got into right. it, and I started cooking cooking a lot here and there. You know, at home when I lived when I lived at home, and then yeah. And then I moved in with a friend, and he was also really into cooking. We would have dinner parties all the time, barbecues, and we really just kind of pushed ourselves to a higher, higher level. And then I was, I was thinking like, what can I do with food in terms of a profession or a job or a way to make money off of it? And I wanted to have a restaurant, but I realized that it's way too much work, and it's not. It's just, it's really tough. Yeah, super, super tough biz to get into. So now. In the current world, it's you're able to sort of be a food personality, perhaps, and mm-hmm. and make a living doing that. So I have a food podcast, and then I've done some the stew, yeah, the stew. Do a food podcast. I've done some like ev- special events with other food media mm-hmm. outlets, and like hosted a few things, and done a few panels, and I've done a couple pop up restaurants. Oh, cool! I'm working on writing a cookbook. Nice. I'm always trying to like have myself get hired by someone to be on TV or something like that with food yeah. related to the food game. Yeah. Um, basically, I'm trying to make money off of food any way I can other than having my own restaurant mm-hmm. or being a chef professionally at a restaurant because yeah. it's just, you know, I'm, my, my DJ life is like work a few hours a week and then have free time to do whatever else you want, you know, make music, right. travel, yeah. hang out whatever it is you're into um and as a as a chef like 18 hours a week or 18 hours yeah, a day yeah, sure sure sweating it out right. hard physical labor stress and ordering just it's a real i've i've dabbled in it a little bit and mm-hmm. it's not not the game for me yeah these hands are too soft for that shit <laughs> <laughs> yeah for sure no it, but i'm trying to yeah i'm trying to keep the keep the food podcast going yeah and you know just see see where where it takes me hopefully someone will in, in enjoy my unique brand of whatever is there a do you have a brand as it relates to food <sighs> not really that's why i want to have a cookbook okay i mean i'm sort of like but you have one in your mind I guess like my brand in my mind is like the whole food world is kind of very neutered and safe and sort of catering to housewives Mm -hmm. and everything is just happy and fun and sure and vice is kind of doing Mm -hmm. a little bit differently Mm -hmm. but it's a little bit more it's a little bit too far out with like yeah like the majority of the food stuff is like we're gonna make cookies and we're gonna have a champagne and blah 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 and right. it's gonna be perfect and then the vice is kind of like we're gonna do fucking weed pcp barbecue and then we're gonna you know like they they go like a little yeah. too craze sure which i and en- i enjoy i would rather watch that stuff than than like a show on the food network or right. whatever and that's that's all boring but i would like i want to be somewhere in the middle where it's like i can teach people about food i can teach them how to cook i can have uh, you know a dude at home who doesn't know shit wants to get into cooking they can see how i do it and the way i approach it Mm -hmm. and then think like hey i could do that too and have you know more people be be stoked on cooking than instead of just saying like oh i can't do it and then having a little little more of a sense of humor to things not taking it so seriously Mm-hmm. So it's it's sort of walking the line between like having a fun comedy time, but also like a scientific learning side to it as well. Yeah, science comedy. Science comedy. I love it. Science comedy, but not as dorky. Hopefully. <laughs> um, 
what is the is there a correlation between food and music um i don't know i mean i i guess a little bit let's make one up i i I, i'd I'd say for me both of them are they can be relaxing and therapeutic Mm -hmm. like it's very if you're really into cooking it's nice to just spend an afternoon making some making a dish Mm -hmm. that takes five hours and you kind of organize everything and you get it all lined up and you you cook it up and then there's a you have a sense of accomplishment when Mm -hmm. it's done it's it's very it's there's there's similarities and differences with music. Like when you make a song, you spend a long time on it, you make it, and like you never really know what people think about it. Sure. Because people are either going to lie to you and say that's dope or they're not going to say anything at all or they're right. just going to say it was tight or whatever, but when you when you cook some somebody a dish, you get the instant gratification that you yearn yeah. for as somebody yeah. who's in music or movies or comedy or whatever it is like mm-hmm. at the end of the day everyone is sort of yearning for the praise from everyone yeah you want to have somebody say you did a good job so if you make a sick ass lasagna and 10 people say this is amazing you feel right. great and you want you, you get that rush and you want to do it again mm-hmm. and then you're like what if a million people thought my lasagna was fucking sick whereas you know the music stuff it, it can be a little bit harder because people, you know, everyone's a critic about music and about food. Right. But food sort of speaks to everyone. Mm-hmm. And music, like, I love music and I love the music that I make, but it's definitely not for everyone. Right. Um, you know, same for Steve Aoki. He mm-hmm. has a million fans, but there's a lot of people who don't like it. Mm-hmm. And same for everything. But for food, it's kind of like everybody fucking loves a quesadilla, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, although I heard on your show... Uh, uh, on the stew, you were talking. There was the San Francisco burrito. Oh yeah, episode. And uh, oh, you probably it, have a little something to say about that. Well, yeah, because I'm a San Francisco guy, and I grew up like that was you know lunch hour, mm-hmm. at least two three days a week. Really? We, yeah, for sure. How are you not a f- obese person, dog? Uh, you know, when you're a kid, you can eat. Anything. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, like in high school, we'd go. Yeah, gone are the days where you can have three giant yeah. fucking burritos a week for sure. and just be chilling. Yeah. No, I do it because now I don't eat carbs at all. So that's poor like, guy. Yeah, it's, it sucks. I got it all. I got it all in in my teens. No carbs. Um, no drugs. No, I did. No I, alcohol. I took care of everything in my teens, and then. Good for you. That's it. So, you know, it's very efficient. <laughs> mm-hmm. I got a lifetime in and four years of high school. What what carb do you miss the most? Uh, a nice giant tortilla? Chocolate chip cookies. Chocolate chip cookies. Yeah. Well, you can get those carb-free, right? Yeah, you can, but they're not. But It's not, it's the, not the same. No. Um, do you have a gluten deficiency? <laughs> or do you just... Like an intolerance? Yeah. Like no, it, no, no. It no, doesn't just, make you sick. You just no, choose not I to. I just choose not to. And so on you, occasion, I break the rule, but it's a sure you know. have a slice of cake on your birthday right yeah i'm not really a cake guy but i would have a burrito before a slice of cake you're more of a pie man pie and cookies and ice cream you're a cookie man yeah black and white cookie eh, you chocolate know. chip is number one chocolate chip well sure. what kind of ice cream vanilla chocolate or a chocolate chip you're a chocolate or, head yeah I'm a, I'm a chocolate yeah i'm learning um, a lot buddy <laughs> what else you want to know no wait so um <laughs> Yeah, the burrito thing was interesting because you had a guest on who didn't really, wasn't impressed, which I, you know, but I get it. Like everyone's, you know. It's 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 tough. You have to realize that all these things are regional, sure. regional faves. Yeah, and it's funny because I think Mexican food in particular is really hard to re- recreate. Like I've been around the world and you can get, you know, decent Chinese food in mm-hmm. a lot of the world. Good enough uh, pizza. Yeah, good enough. Burger, right? whatever. And then you get to Mexican food, and it just sucks. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't know what it is. I don't know what it we is had, We went. We had Mexican food in Beijing, and it was just, like, terrible. But, you know, well, you expect that's it your, to, that's no, your... you expect it to be terrible. But they got the sombreros and the tequila, and you're right, just like, oh, right, this is going to be fun, you know? And it was. It was fun. It was just <laughs> shitty food. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I don't know why. Because you're using ingredients that everyone has access to. Yeah. It's they're not really doing anything like although mystical. I think they're you know in China they're probably a handful of people importing avocados and like yeah the, you don't want to be eating avocados in Beijing <laughs> probably not 
You have to cut through the smog layer. That's right. Of that of that avocado. <laughs> that's for sure. Um, yeah, I mean that that's tough because you grew up with this San Francisco burrito. Yeah. Where everyone from San Francisco is will like kill somebody over. Like they'll defend those to their death. And they go crazy over you know this restaurant versus that one. Yeah. And whatever. somebody can just be like, eh, not into it. Yeah. And you're like, how the yeah, fuck? Yeah. How does that? Does that happen, dog? Yeah. Same thing for me in Del Taco. Is that right? I grew up eating Del That's Taco. Fair. Dude, we used to drive through Orange County and you're like, how do they fit this many fast food restaurants mm -hmm. in one place? Nothing to do, bro. Nothing to do but dip stuff into guacamole. Unbelievable. <laughs> That's for sure. He gets it. <laughs> yeah, he knows. You can't take it you can't take it personally or offensive though. No, of course not. Uh so is there a Like the sense I get with your career is there's not like a a main thing that it all just sort of fits together. That is correct. Yeah. I, I'm un unfortunately one of those people that sort of has to, is into a lot of things and wants to do all of them at the same time. I don't know that that's unfortunate. I mean, I think. It has pros and cons. Yeah. You can, you can, you can get less done because sure. you're spreading yourself out. A little too thin mm -hmm. instead of devoting all the energy into one thing but it can be more satisfying to have uh, a more varied resume mm -hmm. of accomplishments mm -hmm. I, I like being that way yeah because I'm into so much stuff I don't want to limit myself to just one thing and is that has that been a like have there been moments where you're like oh, I should just produce music and try to be you know a huge producer and not do all this other stuff or like, yeah have you, have you it's always changing wrestling my, with those it, yeah, decisions I'm always wrestling with those decisions yeah but I mean usually for what I'm doing now like while I'm still young enough I'm, I'm still doing music I'm still DJing mm -hmm. just because I love doing it and you can make a nice living doing it and I'm not gonna be able to do it forever so yeah. I'm going to sort of ride ride that wave as long as I can until it's time to hang hang the headphones up as it were yeah. and then move into, you know, something more food related probably. Mm -hmm. Or you know, whatever else I'm into, podcasting, who knows. But just I I like to have a lot of things going on at once and sort of feel like I'm doing a, a good job at and more than just one thing. So where where the podcasting? How'd you get into podcasting, and why uh, take on two at a time? <laughs> well, I, I've I've always been really into comedy, and I never did. You did, ever try it? I never I never tried it. No. I've I was always a comedy fan. I grew up watching SNL as a little kid. Who was your favorite? <sighs> no, I don't have a favorite, bro. Oh, that's but, right. But I mean, I remember I being no like. Favorites five six years old yeah. and watching snl just growing up with it and being super into it and then kids in the hall and watching all these 90s comedy shows and then being into stand-up watching i watched martin lawrence mm -hmm. you so crazy stand-up while mm -hmm. stoned eating tater tots like four million times super into it but i never really thought my of myself as somebody who would be like a stand-up comedian and this was before like the current age where like oh if you're into comedy you can be a writer right you can do a funny short on Funny or Die. You can get a job at Netflix writing this show. You can do, mm -hmm. there's a million different things you can do. But back then it was kind of like you can be a stand up or you could like write a comedy movie. Right. And I didn't know how to do any of that. So, yeah. and I, I was too scared to try and do stand up. I didn't know anyone who did it. So mm -hmm. I just sort of was a fan for a long time. And then when podcasting started surfacing, I was like, you know what? I'll, I, my favorite kind of comedy is just conversational just talking with a random person for an hour and just you know making fun of them they make fun of me mm -hmm. you get on a weird tangent and talk about some random shit you might discover something awesome it might suck who knows uh and then i just started doing it i asked a few friends got the mics recorded it all and uploaded it and slowly started started building it and now uh, my main podcast, Tall Tales, has been going on for like five years. Wow. Long fucking time. Yeah. And we have like, you know, we have thousands of listeners. It's awesome. We have yeah. people that come and support us. We've done live shows and, you know, sell merch and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. 
It's great. And we've had some big guests on. A lot of people listen to it all over the world. It's cool. And then I started doing the food podcast. Which How long has that been? It's been probably a year and a half. Oh, nice. And that's that's kind of, you know, it's it's growing and turning into something interesting. And we're we're having a lot of people in the food world get into it yeah and so it's it's the podcasting is a great way if you don't know what you're doing you're not very good at meeting people it's an amazing way to become friends with people yeah because it's hard in in this day and age to be like hey here's a guy i think is cool i don't know him i don't know his friends really but i want to like maybe we would be friends and it's right. weird yeah, it's sure. weird to just be like yo let's do you want to get coffee and maybe hang out? Because I think we'd be really good friends. Like yeah. people don't really do that shit anymore. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. you kind of have to Everybody's meet people busy. through people. But you can be like, send them a tweet and be like, "Yo, come do my podcast uh, on Thursday, ten o'clock, whatever it is. They'll come by. There's you, you break the ice. You have a reason to talk, and then mm -hmm. you spend an hour getting to know each other. Mm -hmm. And you, it, by the end of it, you can be like, "Wow, I really like this guy. We're friends now. We have a connection." And I can just be like, hey, man, what's up? We're, we are now friends. Yeah. Or I don't need to be friends with this person anymore because I spent an hour with them and they fucking suck. Or they're really dumb. and <laughs> We're I don't done. Yeah. yeah. It's like speed dating for friends. Yeah, yeah. That's and and it gets, it's a great icebreaker. So I like that. if you're listening at home, if you're listening to this a podcast right now, you're probably not good at meeting people. <laughs> so start your own. We have a lot of shut-ins and uh, yeah. loners. I mean, that's the podcast game. Absolutely. Was there were there podcasts that inspired you early on? Like any any favorites? Not not a ton. I mean, I sort of started listening pretty early in the podcast <laughs> game. So yeah. there wasn't that much going on. It was like there was like Mark Marin and Adam mm -hmm. Carolla and Joe Rogan and like all the all the big ones. So I'd kind of dabble with them and like I listened to some and I didn't like some you know depending on the guests and then yeah. it started growing and then all the NPR stuff is on there and then every single stand up comedian has a podcast now mm -hmm. so that's really fun to listen to and there's a bunch of cooking podcasts and but now there's a million podcasts about everything what are the best ones for you right now um i really like listening to bodega boys mm -hmm. it's a podcast a couple of guys from New York that are pretty popular in the in the pod game. I'm I'm looking at my phone right now. Um, what else do I listen to? I listen to a, a podcast called Sampler. Okay. Which is on Gimlet. Yeah. And they kind of it's like a a greatest hits of the week for various different podcasts. Oh, cool. Uh, I listen to the KCRW Good Food podcast. Mm -hmm. I listen to Ninety Nine Percent Invisible. Mm -hmm. I listen to uh, a couple of friends of mine. Um, they do a podcast called Waste of Time with It's the Real. Yeah, yeah. And I've done their show a few times. They've done my show. That one's that one's tight. Yeah. And then um, we'll do one more. A lot of people seemed. I mean, cereal is whack now. First cereal is tight. Maybe um, as you get older, you might be into the Dinner Party Download. Okay, if you're if you're in your thirties, listen to the dinner party download. Okay, unless you're like a shitty thirty per thirty year old. If you're in your thirties and you're homeless, don't listen to it. But like if you're All in right. your thirties and you like you have your fuck together. with you, uh, like, yeah, you have a J Crew suit <laughs> and a fucking Prius. This is your podcast, dog. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> I love it. Um, that's so great. <laughs> And you're st and you stay. Uh, how long are you gonna keep DJ? I don't know. Maybe um, five more years. I would say. Okay. Have a have a run with it. For we'll set five the clock. Years. Today. Set the clock. Yeah. I mean, I don't think I'll ever stop DJing completely because yeah. I love it so much. But in terms of like the doing it as the grind, like you know, playing once a week mm -hmm. or what you know, at least once a week, various things. I'll slow it down after a while you know i'm sure once i have a kid because my girlfriend dj's as well right so it's not like we we sort of both live that weird sporadic lifestyle where sometimes you is that is that tough dating a dj or is it or, you would is you would like, think it would be but it's all right yeah I, I'm, I'm sort of getting a taste of my own medicine yeah 
being a DJ my whole life and sort of being fine with it and having other people deal with it. Sure. And now I'm I'm dealing with it as well. Yeah. But it, it works out well. As you know, they say like actors should not date other actors, but like you know, one in a hundred works out perfectly. Right. Luckily, mine is working out. Knock on wood. Nice. Knock on wood, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. Well, I know we're almost out of time. Um, uh, I have a couple last questions. Speed round. Speed round. We'll All get right. to that. Um, yeah. Actually, before the speed round, what um, what's been the toughest challenge that you've had to overcome? Um, I would I would say the toughest challenge for me was going from when you when you when I moved up to LA, I had no money completely broke had no idea what I wanted to do with my life and then luckily I sort of stumbled upon this world but the, the toughest challenge I've had is when you when your first job is being your own boss you kind of don't have a lot of um, leadership and yeah. structure in place so I kind of I didn't have some early structure set up for me mm -hmm. to where I knew how to I mean I had people helping me here and there but it, it wasn't like i started off at a company right and there was like you do this and you do this and you do this and these are the higher ups and they tell you what to do and you sort of are groomed into the young adult that you need to be to turn into a functioning person i was right. kind of like fuck i got a pocket full of money yeah i do whatever the fuck i want i'm so tight yeah which is f great and fun but yeah i didn't have anyone sort of telling me like yo you should do this and so you should you, not do this have you grown out of that or is it important to hang on to some of that i've i've hung on to a little bit of it yeah it's you get really spoiled being your own boss i mean yeah. there's so many pros and cons like when 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 i have a boss telling me you have to do these tasks by this time or else you're going to be in trouble <laughs> you fucking do them right because that's what you do but when you're like i need to email this person i got to I'm supposed to do this tweet. Yeah. I got to record this thing here. I should finish this song. And nobody is telling me you need to do these things by a certain time. You're just yeah. kind of like, you have to tell yourself that's, that's the hard part. So I'm learning every day to, you know, have to set structure for myself. I mm -hmm. have to set timelines for different tasks and I have to be on top of them. And luckily the calendar apps are very nice nowadays sure so i can have my calendar synced up and mm -hmm. my girlfriend's calendar is all synced up and we know these are the things because we're both the same way she's a lot better at it than i am she's very organized yeah and i'm i'm a little more loosey-goosey so i'm learning from her she has her structure set up like here's i'm doing this i'm doing this i want to finish this by this and when nobody is breathing down your neck to do it you can kind of be like eh i'll do it tomorrow right and yeah, yeah, that's course. that's that's the tough part because right. you're 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 getting less work done but you're also like having a, fun, a more fun time yeah your your quality of life is is enjoyable sure but then you don't get the sense of uh satisfaction of a a job well done or hard day's work yeah i like to you know when you when you have an office job or a manual labor job or anything like that where you work hard all day long when you go home and you have that beer or you have that whatever it is, you have that, that smoke or whatever you do, mm -hmm. you really feel like you earned it and you look forward to it all day or like, oh, I'm going to, when I'm done on Friday, I'm going to go out to dinner with my friends and we're going to have a couple of drinks and right. we're going to dance and have fun. And you enjoy that so much more if you spent your whole day working hard towards something else. Mm -hmm. If you just fucked off all day, played video games, like that drink or that club or that whatever release at the end of the night, it doesn't really mean anything because yeah. you didn't really earn it. Hear that, kids? Stay off the video games. Stay off the video games. Yeah, you gotta you gotta earn earn your. I like to try and balance it out. Yeah. Earn it. So what's earn your, your fun? What's what's the fun? What's your reward? What's Alcohol, your go -to? drugs, okay. and uh, what's your, what's your drink of choice? Uh, I, I like free fed. I like tequila. Okay. I like mezcal. Okay. I like um, bourbon. 
I like wine and beer. I don't really yeah. drink as much as I used to. I used to drink a lot, yeah. but everyone did. In That's their, what happens when when they were younger. But now that I now that I'm older, I don't really drink that much. Usually, the only time I'm drinking is if I'm DJing. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like a a little release. Sure. Um. So so smoke a little pot. Yeah. Why not? Nothing crazy, but that's it. That's it. Okay. Nice. No, no, uh, nothing, nothing wild. Yeah. Maybe a little Netflix. <laughs> if I'm feeling bad. Nice. Uh, <laughs> so if, so you mentioned, you know, not having that, like, uh, someone to kind of show you the ropes. So are you, are you a reader? Do you, do you pick it up? You know, do you go to books and pick shit up or, or you figure it out on your own? In in terms of like finding a structure on how to yeah like I I don't know do you read like those business books and I don't really I don't no. I don't but I I do blogs I don't podcasting know. yeah is another great way there's a lot of sort of self help right podcasts in turn you know for whatever whatever you need to excel at there are ten podcasts for it at at least so. There, whenever I'm feeling like I need to really hunker down and get some shit done and and, mm-hmm. and manage myself, you know, I'll I'll reach to some of those. There's one, the uh, Tim Ferriss podcast is like probably the most popular one, sure. where he'll have you know very successful independent business entrepreneurs sharing all of their mm-hmm. their habits and and what they do to excel. Mm-hmm. It's good to listen to one of those every once in a while and, and kind of take a take a few things here and there. Yeah. And just kind of, you know, everyone's so busy running around. You need to stop, you know, stop at least once a day. Just stop and think about everything, and just let your let your brain have something pop up every mm-hmm. once in a while. Nobody has an, a, an imaginative thought anymore, really, because of all of our overstimulation. Sure. So it's nice to remember, like, hey, my brain is full of cool ideas, and if you stop and give it a chance to have one pop up that's good that's all you i mean if you're a creative artist person that's you need you need to do that mm-hmm. i have to come up with a sick idea for a funny tweet or a cool dish yeah or a song idea or whatever and you have to stop and do that so just talk briefly about you know you mentioned the tweet right so you, you run your own social media mm-hmm. and you have these brands or properties that you're building right and obviously mm-hmm. social is really important for that mm-hmm. um so are you like verified yes <laughs> <laughs> is there um like is there a social media strategy like or, um there is know, not a social media strategy i i, I so what, what are your tricks or habits that work for what you're doing in social um well for me like i i, I prefer instagram mm-hmm. i like i've always been into photography and, and imagery and i like to do a little it's kind of like a, a, a window into what into your life so i have a little bit of food i have a little bit of music i have some comedic images Mm -hmm. um, and then also i'm into you know art and typography and graphic design so i'll have a little bit of that and it's sort of just like here's a visual representation of who i am instead of you know there's a lot of a lot of people are kind of they have a goal with what they want to do with their instagram like i need to do this one kind of picture with this filter to right. have this aesthetic for yeah. all of these people who are into that same aesthetic to like me and i'm not really into that i'm i'm into just mind spray here is me on an instagram there's a bunch of shit that you probably might not like but mm-hmm. there's going to be some cool stuff too and i'm a little bit weird i'm a little bit different and i don't care if it gets like a million views or if it gets 10 views it's just like what i want to do and then i think twitter is just made for news and funny one-liner jokes um and a little bit of you know self-promotion of things i don't i I don't use facebook Mm -hmm. because it's fucking horrible the worst shit of all time and i don't use snapchat because i don't think i'll be able to handle handle that Mm -hmm. i think that's a little it's a little click too much into into that world yeah a lot of people i mean most people love it and i I had it for a couple of weeks and I just couldn't, I just couldn't hang with it. It's just, I don't need, I don't, I don't care. It's, it's, it's like all the little things that aren't good enough for Instagram and Twitter mm-hmm. happen on 
Snapchat, and I don't care about that stuff. Yeah. It's like here I'm getting my nails done, or right. Yeah, sure. I'm at the car wash. Isn't this crazy? Or just yeah. stuff that's like it's not that crazy, dog. I get my car wash too. <laughs> whatever you know, like yeah. I've been to I've been to that street that you're driving on, or like I've you're at an airport. Right. That's good for you, dog. <laughs> if you if it's not good enough to Instagram, then we don't we don't need to see it. For sure. I don't need to see you in a fucking dog filter either. <laughs> I don't. I don't care that you can do a face swap with uh, your sister. It's not funny to me. Amazing. My <laughs> wife is all into the face swap. Everyone is. It's crazy. All right. So no offense uh, to your wife. No, she'll be all right. <laughs> Does um, your wife listen to this? No, definitely not. <laughs> uh, so okay, I know you don't like picking favorites, but. Uh, Give us you don't so you don't have to just stick with one if there's if, if there's you a if you give me a mind. multiple choice I can do it favorite DJs favorite DJs I mean ooh that's a, that's an interesting one I mean I really like I mean originally AM was a big one for me mm-hmm. oh I really like Fortet okay um Jamie XX yeah is a really good DJ um. I mean, there, there's so many. Brodinski is a really good DJ. My girlfriend is a good DJ. Shout out your girlfriend. Shout out my girlfriend. So super Sam. There's there's so many good DJs that I can't think of right now. Okay, <laughs> fair enough. Uh, what about chefs? Favorite chefs? Uh, favorite chefs. That's a, that's another good one. Um, there's a guy in Austin named Paul Key Q U I. I think he does really cool stuff. Okay. There's um, a restaurant in here in L.A. called Rustic Canyon. There's a guy named Jeremy Fox who mm-hmm. actually lives around the corner from me. He does some really awesome stuff. I think there's a guy named Francis Malman mm. who you can look on Netflix. Yeah. And there's like a, a – sh- it's either a Mind of a Chef or a Chef's Table, one of those mm-hmm. chef shows on Netflix. Mm-hmm. There's an episode with that guy, and I feel like he's like – He's the dude. He's kind of the uh, old school godfather of like South American barbecuing and grilling. Nice. And he like lives like the the best life of all time. He like lives in a remote island in in Patagonia. Oh shit. He has like a young ass baby mama that he's not married to. He's like rich as fuck. He just like smokes cigars and drinks wine all day. That's the dude wearing like cool sweaters. Nice, it's cool tight sweaters. Mm-hmm. That's the key. Yeah, I, I would I would say he he's and then like people aren't really doing that anymore. Yeah, everyone is like a YouTube doofus, right. right? And he's like very, he's very swaggy. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, I know you're into comedy, so give us some favorite comedians. Martin Lawrence. Um, I really like I I like Chelsea Peretti. She's uh-huh. really funny. Yeah. Um, I mean Hannibal Burris is is cool. I mean there's there's so many of them that I can't remember. I mean I used to I used to see a lot of stand up from like David Cross, mm-hmm. Patton Oswalt, um, shit, who else? And is then good? and then the classics, you know, Eddie Murphy's and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. No Bill, I was never a Bill Cosby fan. No. Rape, rape or no rape, <laughs> just never vibed with me. He had um, one and also too. my man Brandon Wardell, who did this show. Yes, he did. <laughs> yeah, we love Brandon. <laughs> yeah, he's a friend of mine. Nice and a comedian. Yeah, so I know he he mentioned you, he name dropped you. Oh, great! Uh, that that you, uh, DJ, he, you are his. You make oh, it possible yeah. for him to DJ. Yeah, we've done a couple DJ sets where basically he's like, "Hey, I want to DJ one of your parties," and I was like, "All right." And then he's like, I don't know how to DJ, and I don't have any DJ equipment. That's quite a pitch. Yeah. So basically, it, it works out better. Like, he can't DJ, and I can. Yeah. So it's better off that I do it for him instead. Yeah. And it, it's it's funny because it's embarrassing and interesting at the same time because yeah. he has, like, as a comedian, he's, like, a very – he's a very funny dude, and he'll be like, what if you play these – 17 horrible songs in the middle of this DJ set <laughs> that's tight 
And then I'm sort of the one who has to do the DJing. So right. people are going to look at me and think that I'm I'm the one who played this Avril Lavigne song after <laughs> this Waka, Waka song. <laughs> but then it's a challenge. Like once you get over the fact that like I'm going to be playing all of this shit, then it's it's you're out, you're stepping outside of your box because you're like how am i going to mix this horrible song into this normal song that i would normally play uh-huh. and then suddenly you can stumble like rihanna bitch better have my money mixes amazingly with lit my own worst enemy <laughs> And I would have never known that unless Brandon Wardell put both of those songs on his playlist. He's got the knack. Yeah. For listeners at home, if you DJ, play those two songs <laughs> together at the same time. It is, it is lit indeed. Nice. Well, thanks for being here, man. This was fun. Uh, My pleasure. I love, I love the stuff you had to say. Thank you. Let's, uh, let's promote the shows. Uh, yes. I do two podcasts, Tall Tales and... Tall Tales is more like this show, a little comedy talk, talking thing. And then The Stew, which is all about food. Same kind of vibe, but only about food. Yeah. And both of those are on iTunes. You should go listen to them. And then where do people find you online? People can find me on all the all the websites, Twitter, SoundCloud, Instagram, is just at them jeans, all one word. T-H-E-M-J-E-A-N-S. Nice. See me in these streets. I throw a few parties in LA. You can see all of those on my Instagram or, or whatever. Come out and, and check that out. And thank you for listening. Thank you for having me on. Oh, thanks. Okay, bye. Okay, that was our show for today. I hope you enjoyed it. Dem Jeans, check him out online. Check out his podcasts. And leave us a note. Let me know what you thought of that. Hit us on Twitter. At Rebel Radio Net, hit our Facebook page or leave us a review on iTunes. I'd love to hear what you think. Most importantly, come back next week for more Rebel Radio. Later.